Rock. I'm the director for the project on nuclear issues here. Um, this is our ninth year. It's hard to believe it's been that long. Next year will be our tenth year. Hopefully for several more years after that. Uh, Pony is not just a program where staff sort of do research and write and come together and do the typical things we do at think tanks. It's really uh, an organization that has three missions that have evolved over time. Uh, the first was to create a network community of young professionals across the nuclear enterprise. Then it was to generate new thinking about nuclear issues from this younger community. And then finally, we've developed a series of sort of leadership development. So we try to help facilitate the development of the next generation of leaders in this area. Uh, People are familiar with this issue, uh, uh, this event, Pony Debates the Issues. We also have a blog uh, that's pretty well used, not by me, I have to admit, because I'm a troglodyte when it comes to these kind of things, or a Luddite, I guess, is, uh, is the more appropriate word. Uh, I've never really gotten into blogging because I've always felt like if I can't look somebody in the face while I'm trying to yelled them down. I lost a comparative advantage uh, during that time, but we have a, a very active blog, Pony Debates the Issues. We do a conference series uh, where we do three smaller conferences that lead to an annual conference at, uh, at STRATCOM, where the best presentations are made to the STRATCOM leadership at that time, and we have a number of Young Nuclear Scholars programs, uh, as well a Next Generation Working Group that sort of functions as a commission and others as well. Uh, so it's a fairly broad range of activities, but this Pony Debates the Issues has been one of the most popular ones. Uh, Mark Jansen, who is the Deputy Director for Pony, will introduce the speakers and he's going to moderate today's debate. Even though he's from a conflict resolution background, we're assuming that he knows how to foster a debate rather than to resolve differences between the debaters. But his uh, fellow colleagues, all of whom are debaters, will be the judge of that. Mark, over to you. Thanks, Thanks Clark. Uh, yeah, my name is Mark Jansen. I'm a deputy director of the Project on Nuclear Issues at CSIS. Thanks all for coming out tonight uh, for this evening's event, uh, live debate on U.S. policy towards Iran. Uh, I think all of you understand that the U.S. and uh, Iran have been at loggerheads over the nuclear issue for quite some time. Um, but, um, and, I, and I think that tonight's debaters would even agree that U.S. policy thus far uh, has failed to achieve its primary purpose of bringing Iran into full compliance and cooperation with the IAEA. Um, however, I think that they uh, disagree on why it has failed. Um, recently, the U.S. and European partners have imposed extensive sanctions on Iran um, in order to pressure it to acceding to certain demands. And, and cooperate more fully with the IAEA. Uh, there is debate, however, uh, among our participants tonight as to whether or not this is the right approach or whether it is, in fact, counterproductive. Um, that brings us to tonight's resolve statement, which is that the new sanctions placed on Iran will make it more difficult to achieve a diplomatic solution to the dispute over its nuclear program. Arguing the affirmative on my right is Dr. Suzanne Maloney, a senior fellow at the Sabin Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institution. Uh, arguing the negative is Mr. Michael Rubin, who is a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, both have written extensively on Iran and on U.S. policy on the nuclear issue. Um, each participant will make opening remarks of 10 minutes. They will then be given an opportunity to cross-examine each other. each other. I will follow up with a few questions. Uh, after that, we will open it up for audience Q&A, and then both debaters will be given an opportunity to make closing remarks at the end. Uh, with that, uh, Dr. Maloney, I'll turn it over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mark, and thanks to CSIS for organizing this event and bringing together a good group of people on a Monday night when you all could be home watching the red carpet analysis of last night's Oscars. <laughs> Thank you all for TiVoing that um, and agreeing to come and listen to something a little bit more serious. Um, I am going to start off by just stipulating that uh, despite the fact that Michael and I have been disagreeing on Iran for probably more than a decade, starting uh, I think on a bus from Tehran to Kashan back in 1999 when we both were in Iran for a summer of Persian language study and doctoral dissertation research, 
Um, we don't disagree on necessarily everything. So let me just stipulate a couple of um, assumptions so that we don't necessarily waste our time or that we, you don't presume that you have the diametrically opposed views of all things on Iran here tonight. First, uh, let me just stipulate that I'm not here to debate whether or not Iran is pursuing a nuclear weapons capability. I think the circumstantial case that has been made in the public is uh, sufficiently compelling for all those, with the exceptions possibly of Belarus and Cuba, to acknowledge that Iran's nuclear program is not one that has a purely civilian dimension to it. Let me also stipulate that pressure is necessarily part of any U.S. diplomatic strategy for dealing with the array of threats that Iran poses to the international community, to American interests, and to regional security in the vital area of the Persian Gulf today. But I do think that this question of the current U.S. sanctions, which in effect have almost been lost in the kind of hype that we hear and see on television and in the media about the question of the prospect of war, whether or not these particular sanctions, the de decision to designate the, the Iranian Central Bank, the subsequent decision by the European Union to launch a boycott or embargo of imports of Iranian crude, and more recent measures to effectively excise Iran from the international financial system, are likely to produce the outcome that the U.S. government and its allies, China, Russia, and the European Union plus Germany, have su suggested that they are intending to produce, which is a negotiated resolution to Iran's nuclear ambitions. I do not believe that these measures are likely to be effective in doing so. Let me just suggest the reasons why I believe that. First of all, I think it comes down to Iran's long experience with sanctions. Iran has had 31, 33 years now of experience with American and, to some extent, multilateral sanctions. They are very, the regime is very well versed in a variety of mechanisms to mitigate the impact of sanctions, to evade through smuggling and other measures the impact of sanctions, and of course uh, to threaten and to affect retaliation for sanctions. And as a result, they have been able to insulate at least the government and its stability from the direct impact of these sanctions uh, over many years. And that is why you have seen the sort of response that you've seen from the Iranian leadership over the course of the past two months, a response which is both defiant in the suggestion that sanctions will have no impact, but also quite threatening in the uh, discussion of the Iran's ability to close the Straits of Hormuz, through which much of the world's oil exports pass on a daily basis. These issues, this Iranian comfort level with sanctions, in fact, the Iranian embrace of sanctions, which is another dimension of the response, uh, are key to the reasons that I believe that sanctions will not produce the result that we're looking for. The second reason, and I'm going to kind of flag these and go into a little bit of greater detail at the end to the extent that I have time to do so, is the shifting patterns of trade. If, for example, we had been able to achieve the level of multilateral cooperation that we have today on Iran, if, for example, we had been able to achieve a European embargo first of new investment in Iran's energy sector and more recently, of course, the decision to embargo imports of Iranian crude a decade or more ago, then one might have been able to argue that it would have had a sort of devastating blow on the Iranian economy. But today, with Iran's economy more and more increasingly dependent and interlocked with Asian economies, and in particular China, the impact of these sanctions, even if they're fully enforced on the most willing partners of the United States and its allies, is likely to be somewhat moderate and somewhat muted. And for that reason, Iran, again, it feeds into the Iranian sense of defiance and confidence that they can, in fact, survive these sanctions. It also, unfortunately, makes us more reliant on the cooperation of a wider variety of allies today. Whereas in the late 1990s, European threat to simply remove their diplomats from Tehran in the aftermath of the Mykonos verdict uh, had, had really, I think, a jolting effect and, and helped to produce some changes in Iranian behavior. Today, the Iranians are quite persuaded that they can live without Europe, and they may not re be wrong in that, in that belief, so long as they're able to continue to do business with their primary trade partners today in, uh, in Asia, and again, in particular, in China. It means that U.S. measures, if they do not uh, produce cooperation from allies, if they in fact lead to greater dissension among the alliance, 
will be less effective and create more difficulties because we rely on that ability to coordinate effectively with the, among the P5 plus one. Let me just say the third reason, and I think the, one, the most important reason, is that today, unlike any other point in Iranian history, we are faced with the most conservative, consolidated regime that we have ever seen. And I say this with a, a sort of sense of frustration and a sense of realism that, of course, you all hear daily about the factionalism and the differences and with the upcoming elections, what this may mean, the fights between Ahmadinejad and Khamenei. But ultimately, it's a fight between hardliners and other hardliners. There are no pragmatists in this Iranian regime. And that is unlike any other point in Iranian history. In particular, the two points in Iranian history when Tehran, in fact, did prove capable of making significant reversals on its security policy. The decision to compromise and come to a conclusion of the hostage crisis, ultimately in 1981, and the decision to accept the poison cup of chalice, the poison chalice, uh, in 1988, as Khomeini described it, and end and accept the ceasefire with the war with Iraq. Those are both points at which there was an active debate among the relevant decision makers of the Islamic Republic, points at which pragmatists won out over hardliners. Today, the pragmatists have ultimately no relevance to Iranian decision making. And in fact, what we see within Iran is a body of decision makers who are bent, who are entirely convinced of the belief that the international community, and in particular Washington, is out to get them. This paranoia is deeply entrenched, and when we have U.S. officials describing the intent of U.S. policies as the collapse of the Iranian economy, we have, in fact, confirmed their deepest paranoia. And so as a result, I think this regime is completely incapable of making the sort of compromises, of co coming to a negotiating, uh, negotiations process in a serious and meaningful way, and that that unwillingness has been more deeply entrenched as a result of the sanctions that have been enacted over the course of the past two months. Finally, let me just make two final points so that we can get on to the discussion and the debate. I think the time frame of the sanctions is terribly problematic. Uh, it's quite positive that we saw the, the implementation of these sanctions deferred over a six-month period for a variety of reasons, to give a number of states an opportunity to find alternative suppliers, to allow oil markets to adjust, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately what it means is a very short window of opportunity before the U.S. elections uh, for us to understand if these sanctions have had any impact. It means that an American administration is going to have to make a decision to either launch some sort of military strike or support some sort of military strike over a very short period of time. Finally, I think the manner of the sanctions is deeply uh, problematic. The way in which they were enacted clearly at the, with a gun to the head of the administration by the Congress with a 100 to 0 vote in the Senate and similar uh, ratios in, on, on the House side. The fact that the administration was unwilling to do this, the fact that you've seen a sort of um, crescendo of measures that have, where we've seen almost no opportunity for the impact to be appreciated and for Iranian reactions to be gauged. I think has not contributed to uh, a, a very measured approach and an opportunity to draw the Iranians back to the table. Finally, I would just say look at oil markets. Oil markets have not reacted vociferously. We have not seen a price spike because ultimately the markets believe that Iran's barrels will get out there somehow. They will come at a deep discount. The Iranian regime will pay a steep price. But remember, of course, that Iran in 2010 made $73 billion in oil revenues. They're predicted to make quite a bit more this year were they not facing these sanctions. This is a regime that fought an all-out war with Iraq on less than $6 billion a year of oil revenues. So don't believe that 20 or 30 percent off $100 a barrel is likely to bring this regime to its knees, not given the political character, not given the shape of their international trade today. Thank you. Is right on time. Uh, Mr. Rubin, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Suzanne began by saying and listing what we agree on. Let me just add one thing which I think both of us agree on, that we both ultimately want a diplomatic solution to the conflict between the United States and Iran. The question today is framed in terms of sanctions, but it could just as easily be framed in terms of setting the right circumstances for diplomacy to succeed. And so I start with that assumption in, in mind. Military strategists often talk about the dime paradigm, where every 
coherent and comprehensive strategy should have a diplomatic and informational, a military and an economic component to it, and that those components Oil, and so as a result, Iran, there's a utilitarian dimension to it. The Iranians threaten the Straits with, with much of the world recognizing that they're unlikely to do that because they're at least as dependent on their ability to export and import through the Gulf as, uh, as any other country in the region, if not more so. Um, but it does have a psychological impact on the markets. And so you see a small spike, and as they do this, particularly at key moments, it has some impact. Um, what I come back to is, is the reality that there just are no low-cost, high-impact ways of changing a country's security policy when that country has such a significant role in the international economy. If the world international community says we are so outrageously offended by Iran's actions that we are willing to simply uh, ban any contact with you know, Iran's oil from the marketplace. We are willing to accept 15, five, you know, 10, $15 a barrel, uh, a gallon oil at the pump in order to deal with this urgent threat to the international community. Then I think you would see some greater impact on Iran's bottom line. But I think as it is, we're trying to have it both ways. We're trying to effectively devastate their economy while ensuring that Americans still have the ability to go to the pump and, and pay a relatively low price for oil, and I just don't think that that's possible. Um, w one other quick question for you. There's another uh, you know, benefit, so to speak, of, of sanctions that's sort of come up a little bit in the analysis recently, and that is that it is now beginning to have effects on Iran's ability to acquire and pay for equipment, more advanced equipment that advances their nuclear enrichment program. Um, if you assume that this, the, the sanctions now are having that effect of delaying Iranian uh, modernization and development of their nuclear program, is that, is, is that time that's being bought by these sanctions worth it? Uh, if not, then, then why not? I think sanctions have always had an impact on slowing the program, and Michael mentioned that. You know, there is, there is more than simply changing the leadership's calculus that gets into the objectives of sanctions there, and there has always been an argument that the sanctions create uh, choices and create new impediments and ultimately have some deterrent effect on the ability to make progress with uh, the, the scope and scale of the program that they're trying to uh, attain. Um, I don't, I haven't seen any evidence that the central bank sanctions in particular are making it more difficult. And ultimately, this is a leadership that has the capacity as a result of the continuing and one would presume uh, future revenue, oil revenues that come into its coffers to insulate itself. They can spread the, you know, ensure that, that the Revolutionary Guard has all the resources that it needs while uh, putting the burden, the primary burden of the sanctions on the less uh, relevant elements of the Iranian regime. And so there's going to be a balance made because they're also interested in trying to ensure some degree of domestic uh, uh, peace. But we have not seen a sort of public willingness to come to the streets. And that's another dimension of the sanctions. As you heard people talk about the central bank, even as you heard people talk about the refined petroleum, there was talk of there will be massive riots in the streets. You know what? Never happened absolutely never happen. Whether it's because Iranians are too politically disillusioned by the disappointment in their own revolution, or whether it's because the regime has been able to buy off key constituencies, I think it's still not clear. But ultimately, I think that there, you know, there is, the, the regime has enough cash to continue its nuclear program at a pretty good clip, and uh, the population does not yet and is unlikely to feel the impacts such that they're willing to go to the streets in a way that will bring down the regime. Thank you. Uh, Michael, a, a couple of quick questions for you as well. Um, you've written and sort of discussed uh, Iran's uh, interest in manipulating uh, negotiations for the purpose of just sort of stalling and misleading the U.S. Um, but, you know, this, this interest to manipula in, in manipulating the United States doesn't come from nowhere. I mean, the U.S. has been openly hostile with Iran for several decades, um, you know, as you know. Uh, as we keep up the sanctions regime, how do, we, how do we mitigate Iran's incentive and desire to manipulate these negotiations? At some point, uh, even if, if pressure works, we are going to have to, to, to negotiate with them on some level. Uh, we have to be prepared to sort of uh, trust them to some extent. Um, how, can you, how can the U.S. make its diplomacy credible while it still is, is, is intent on ratcheting up pressure on Iran? 
Um, how do you resolve that, that dilemma? Well, ultimately, I'd object a little bit to the question because I'd say it's a little bit of, of navel-gazing to suggest that the Iranians' distrust and the lack of their sincerity is a, re a result of American hostility. After all, dating back to the Carter administration, we had relations with the Islamic Republic. That's why nine months after the revolution, we had an embassy there to seize. Perhaps the issue is more one of setting the right circumstances. Uh, Carter's national security advisor, um, Brzezinski, had, had perhaps what could in hindsight be seen as a premature handshake uh, in Algiers when he met with the Iranian prime minister. That photo was what precipitated the student radicals taking the embassy for reasons that had much more with the internal Iranian power um, struggle than anything else. When we had the Iran-Contra affair, today it's remembered for the illegalities of trying to bypass uh, Congress and aid the Contras, but when that episode first started, it was about trying to gain leverage inside Iran to influence the succession of Ayatollah Khomeini. Now, who exposed it? It wasn't the New York Times or the Washington Post. It was the power struggle inside Iran between Rafsanjani's camp and, um, and Mehdi Hashmi's camp, the brother of the son-in-law of Grand Ayat, um, of Khomeini's deputy, Hussein Ali Montezeri. Ultimately, my fault with American diplomacy is a tin ear to setting the right circumstances. We've even had President Obama say that one of the reasons why diplomacy hasn't worked in both Iran and North Korea is because of the popular discord, the factions which exist, and so forth. But this assumes that the supreme leader or the great leader really care that much for public opinion. Ultimately, so long as you have a revolutionary vortex going on, sometimes premature diplomacy can make the situation far worse by allowing radicalization. Um, sorry, sorry to wrap it on, but just one other example. Early on during the negotiations, uh, during the Carter administration, we approached, I think, um, Ibrahim Yazdi, the interim foreign minister. And he gave us Iran's demands, but he was out after a couple weeks. And then we had Sadiq Qubzadeh. And Sadiq Qubzadeh, in order to prove his own revolutionary credentials, added a bunch of demands. And then he was out. And his successor then added demands. So the more we actually pushed diplomacy, the greater a hole we dug for ourselves in order to have a resolution to the Iranian-American diplomacy. Then, quick quick follow-up then to that question. Then how, how will we know uh, that Iran is truly ready uh, to negotiate seriously? What are the indicators that you would look for um, so that you would know, okay, now the time is right uh, to engage diplomatically? What, what, are the, what are the triggers that you're looking for? Well, ultimately, if we look back at history, um, it's an issue of the Iranians acknowledging the cost to themselves was too great. Uh, that would be the case in 1981. I mean, we had any number of mediators which we empowered from the PLO to the, um, uh, to the Algerians at a cost to our own interests, but it was ultimately Khomeini's decision. Likewise, Suzanne referenced the speech of Khomeini drinking a chalice of poison. When we see that sort of response from the Iranians, then perhaps we will know that the situation is right. But until then, while we have to keep the door open to diplomacy, we also have to augment the economic pressure and the military pressure along the periphery of Iran to give the Iranians an incentive to have useful diplomacy. Iran is a tinderbox. Right now, the government is better than the opposition at putting out the sparks. But ultimately, we've got to either raise the cost to Iran of its international isolation or set a situation where the Iranian people will demand greater accountability for themselves. Because I also think Suzanne and I would both agree um, that the Iranian people tend to be far more moderate than the government inside the Islamic Republic. OK, uh, with that, I'd, I'd like to open it up to audience questions. We have a number of people here. A lot of them, I'm sure, are very knowledgeable on these issues. Um, right down front. Could they identify themselves? Yes. And if people who are asking questions could identify themselves and their organization affiliation, that would be appreciated. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Shrikar Galpali. I'm from Transparency International. Um, just had a couple of quick questions. Uh, I think you both have built a very robust historical framework. How do you see re recent events tie into that when you look at, you know, the bombings of the Israeli diplomats, or, which, you know, it could be from Tehran or not. 
you look at the fact that Ahmadinejad has basically said to the, to the six European countries that he would preempt their embargo by, you know, cutting off all exports beforehand. Uh, to me, it seems like they are getting a little more desperate. They are, you know, getting a little more unpredictable, the Iranian regime. So I was just wondering, how do you see that playing out given, you know, how do you see this bluffing game playing out given the past history? Uh, do you see uh, that Iran is just falling apart and will hence, you know, because of the increased cost actually come to the table? Or do you see it as, you know, they might take this to the logical extreme and actually provoke an attack and hence potentially gain legitimacy in the eyes of uh, the Iranian people? I'll start. I mean, I think the Iranian response has been entirely predictable because we have had, a, you know, three decades of experience with sanctions. There's a pattern to the way they respond. It's defiance, retaliation, mitigation, innovation. And we've seen defiance, and we're starting, I think, to see some retaliation. Um, Ayatollah Khamenei, the Supreme Leader, said back in November in a widely noted sermon that Iran would respond to threat with threat. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing. Um, whether it suggests a sort of command structure that is beginning to devolve a greater level of desperation, or whether it suggests that Iran has um, you know, fully abandoned the sort of pretense of, of repairing its relationships with its immediate neighbors and uh, using political liberalization as an argument for greater economic interaction with the world, um, you know, I think remains to some extent to be seen. I, you could make both those arguments at this stage. Um, but uh, I think we're going to see more of the same, and I don't think that it effectively signals that they're more, more prepared to engage in a serious negotiating process. Let me take a broad stab at that and then just disagree or put a different perspective on what Suzanne said. Um, one of the reasons why I think policymakers are taking the Iranian nuclear development so seriously is that there's a belief that if Iran develops its own nuclear weapons capability or nuclear weapons, that they will feel so confident behind their own deterrence that they can lash out for ideological reasons with much greater frequency than perhaps they have in the last couple weeks, um, and that we might see a return to the 1980s with regard to uh, the so-called export of revolution and, and so forth. Now, with regard to whether to the chicken and egg argument, whether they're lashing out in response to sanctions, I'd point out that there's a great deal of hope inside Iran for moderation. After Ayatollah Khomeini died, Rafsanjani and Khomeini came to power, and after the Iran-Iraq war ended, and yet what did we get? We got the Gassamlu assassinations in the heart of downtown Vienna. Likewise, shortly after Klaus Kinkel started talking about this critical engagement, we got the Mykonos assassinations inside downtown uh, in, in Berlin. And then in 1994, we had the um, Buenos Aires bombings of the Jewish C Cultural Center, which suggests that it's not, and this was before, in fact, it was the precipitating reason for much of Bill Clinton's unilateral sanctioning, the executive orders and so forth on Iran. What a lot of people forget, and it's the irony when we get caught up in the political debate in Washington, is by far the administration which took the greatest, the most robust and course of measures against Iran was the Clinton administration, when we look back at the history. Um, but ultimately, this is one of the reasons. Are, are the Iranians lashing out because of sanctions? Will they lash out? Certainly. Two questions there. Is it because of sanctions? I think we could debate that. And the other issue is, would it get worse? Would the status quo be fundamentally different if Iran develops nuclear weapons? Other questions? Um, one over here on the right. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dan Rosenson. I'm from the National Endowment for the Humanities, and this question is for Suzanne. Um, given the innate sort of distrust and paranoia that's uh, come to be one of the hallmarks of the, the arch conservatives in Iran, um, Khamenei being one of them, um, are there any realistic carrots we can offer that would have a more realistic chance of altering their calculus more so than the uh, pressure track? Well, pressure is a stick, not a carrot. And of course, this administration abandoned those words. Uh, this was one of the seminal uh, measures of the early diplomacy to change the vocabulary because the Iranians were offended by the uh, donkey metaphor that is implied by carrot and stick. Um, 
I, I reference this because I think it, it's one of the areas where the administration, you know, focused on on style and not substance. Um, and, and so, you know, carrot and stick are, are words we all have to use because they're just uh, easier to say than, than pressure and persuasion or inducements and punishment or however you want to phrase it. Um, you know, I don't think that there are any clear, uh, you know, there are, there are no rewards that are going to suddenly make uh, this regime stand up and, and alter its basic, I think, fundamental conviction that it needs some kind of a nuclear program, both for its own domestic legitimacy, because they have wrapped themselves around it so tightly over the course of the past decade, but also for some kind of a strategic deterrent against what they see as a, an international community that is um, bent against them, um, one that did not defend the Islamic Republic, uh, that did not even go to the UN and protest the Iraqi use of chemical weapons. And this is, this is all part of their psychology. Um, so I don't think that there is something that we can just dangle in front of them that is going to lead us to uh, a, a compromise. I think ultimately we're going to have to engage in the kind of messy work of diplomacy, which is finding uh, a mechanism, however it might be. And it, 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 it has to start with the P5 plus one because that, is, that has proven to be useful to us in all sorts of fashions in terms of ensuring that there is a multilateral dimension to our diplomacy, but it can't end. It can't be about P5 plus one meetings in Vienna or Geneva or Istanbul that are heavily covered, heavily hyped, in which the Iranians come and give um, prefab speeches that never touch on the nuclear issue. It's got to be a, a mechanism for sitting down and finding the Iranian interlocutors. And there's got to be uh, you know, some identification on the part of the Iranian leadership that they are themselves willing to invest in a process. And we haven't yet seen that. So I don't mean to argue that, you know, that it's out there and if we just grab it, um, I do think we're gonna have to be, able, be willing to make concessions. And that's something that's gonna entail an, a tremendous amount of leadership from any administration. Um, getting into any negotiating process and offering anything to the Iranians because we're asking them to give stuff up. I mean, we, you know, they, they have plenty of incentive to do so, but it's gonna mean looking at what sanctions we can relax in, in exchange for particular concessions. And it's not clear to me, it's another one of the difficulties that I have with the central bank sanctions. They're not conditioned on, on enrichment suspension. And it's entirely conceivable to me today that if Iran were to come to the table and say, here's all our LEU, here are our here's our centrifuge manufacturer program, here's everything, that you would still see a 100 to 0 vote to maintain the central bank sanctions, to say, look, they're working, let's keep them on until they give up Hamas, Hezbollah, Palestine, Islamic Jihad, until they do, you know, and this is the sort of psychology that the Iranians have. And so they're not entirely wrong that there's likely to be a cascade of pressures, that sanctions, once they're put in place, are always very, very hard to undo. And I, you know, remember sitting in, in this very room among companies looking at how they would get into Iraq six months after the liberation of Iraq and the sanctions program still in place. So this is, it, it becomes very difficult. And so our ability to offer even the relaxation of sanctions as a potential inducement to the Iranian leadership is, is incredibly slim. Uh, actually, just a very quick point, and just to enhance something Suzanne said, when it came to the whole carrots and sticks metaphor, it didn't take long to just look at the history of Iranian rhetoric and see how often they use the phrase carrots and sticks before they decided to manufacture a grievance out of it, uh, just as a, a bit of a side note. Good. Clark, you had a question? Hi, Clark Murdoch at CSIS. Um, one thing that both of you said is that you were in agreement that what we needed was a negotiated solution. That it's a diplomatic solution, which means a negotiated solution. I wonder if we're debating the issue of sanctions according to the wrong metric. And that is that if you say that we're trying to manage a dilemma, I'm stealing the concept from a corporate strategist about the differences between solving problems and managing dilemmas. Perhaps in the case of Iran, what we're trying to do is avoid some worst outcomes. Worst outcome like Israeli attack. Worst outcome like you know, uh, nuclear capable Iran. Maybe under, when you're managing a dilemma that you can't really solve, kicking the can down the road doesn't look so bad anymore. So that you apply sanctions not because you think they're gonna work, 
in the sense of receiving your diplomatic solution. You apply sanctions because it increases pressure, it creates a status quo, you can extend the status quo, you convince people there's still non-coercive ways of solving this problem. And if you look at it from this perspective, the acceleration of sanctions that we've seen recently just shortened our time span. If you want to kick the can down the road, you don't create circumstances that put a president in a situation where he can't kick the can down the road. Let me respond to that quickly. Um, uh, uh, just a couple thoughts in, in answer to what I thought was an excellent question. One of the reasons why I would object to what I would call a policy of procrastination, if you will, is because we simply don't know how much time is left on the clock, although there seems to be an increasing consensus that however much time is left on the clock, it's running out. While what, what always grates at me is the press, if you will, almost backhanded celebration when we see that Iran has photoshopped its last missile test or so forth, or that there's been some problems in the centrifuges, because quite frankly, we can learn, I mean, anyone can learn just as much from a failure as they can from a success. The other question, and this relates just as much to an argument that sanctions can give delay for maneuver as a military strike could give a delay at tremendous cost, but a delay nonetheless in the nuclear program, is what policy do we have in place to take advantage of that delay, and ultimately this is where I'll be provocative and say the problem in my perspective with Iran isn't just the nuclear weapons, it's the ideology of the regime that would wield them. And in that case, I would argue that we need not just to have an economic strategy, a sanctioning strategy, but also a strategy that empowers in some way or another uh, the Iranian people to force the government to answer to the people. This is why I've been so interested in the development of independent trade unions inside Iran and so forth, but we can save that for another debate. I'll just leave it with that little provocative note. Can I just? Sure. I, I think you articulated ultimately what US where U.S. policy is headed better than anyone from the current administration has, or perhaps more honestly than anyone from the current administration has, although I, I genuinely... <laughs> I, I genuinely believe that, that the administration and all elements of the administration really want to get to a negotiated solution. That is their aim. But I think that they have kind of stumbled through the back door inadvertently into a policy of long-term containment and regime change in the hope that the degradation of the regime's economic infrastructure will ultimately lead to the collapse of the regime. My concern about that is multiple, uh, multifaceted um, because we're, we have no idea where that leads because and there are worse outcomes, as Michael highlighted, if I can just finish, as Michael highlighted um, in the sense of the growing power of the Revolutionary Guard. And we have very little opportunity or, or capacity to influence uh, political trends within Iran in a positive fashion. We, we seem to have a, a great deal of capacity to influence them in a negative fashion. And so I worry about a policy that is in effect implicitly and not explicitly predicated on the expectation at some point this regime is going to collapse. This, you know, this has been the expectation for 33 years now and it hasn't yet produced the outcome that we're looking for. Um, and so simply trying to wear down this regime in much the same way that we looked at wearing down Saddam Hussein's regime through comprehensive international sanctions. It did not lead to a sort of uh, you know, flourishing Iraqi democracy even after U.S. military intervention. I am not hopeful that a long-term strategy of crippling sanctions on the Iranian regime is going to produce uh, an Iranian Thomas Jefferson. Question. Question in the back, and then one more up front. Thank you. I'm uh, Tom Wood. I'm a nonproliferation policy analyst at Pacific Northwest National Lab. I want to go back to the question of uh, cost of the nuclear program uh, increased by sanctions versus value, the perceived value of the nuclear program. Uh, Dr. Maloney asked this question during the debate. And uh, I, I didn't hear a direct answer to it, but it seems to me uh, where we are is we have demonstrated that even for very uh, severe and uh, 
and almost unanimous sanctions regimes, uh, the cost of those regimes to the Iranian economy will not be sufficient to force them economically to uh, curtail the nuclear program. The cost of the program is simply too small in relation to the economy and in relation to the uh, oil export revenue. I think the more salient question is this question of the value of the nuclear program as perceived by the Iranian regime. And I'd like to ask uh, both panelists or both debaters, under what circumstances could we hope to diminish the value of the nuclear weapons program to the regime? Okay. Um, fundamentally, I think that the greatest value of the program is with regard to Iran's prestige, and we can debate what that value is. Ultimately, I don't think this is about indigenous energy security, because when you actually look at Iran's own internal uranium reserves, you enrich that to uh, low enriched uranium, and then you figure Iran having eight or ten nuclear reactors, which is what they've declared they want, then you have energy security for about 15 years, where at about one-third the price of that, you could upgrade your gasoline, uh, your refineries and so forth, your pipeline network, and provide indigenous energy security for more than 100 years. Now, with regard to the costs, I do think, I, I just want to say I disagree with you. When you have parliamentarians talking about the cost and wanting a close debate, when you have in the course of a week after the currency has crashed a 70% drop in Iranian tourists to Turkey, according to Hordiat Daily News. That ultimately suggests that there's a cost going on. Much more significantly, you have the issue of the head of Qatam al-Anbiya. Um, the IRGC's, I mean, think of it without drawing moral equivalence as a combination between the Army Corps of Engineers and Bechtel, all rolled up into one. Um, that suggests that perhaps the sanctions are having more bite than we give credit for. Um, Ultimately, what I'm interested in doing, given that Iran is a tinderbox, is trying to perhaps blow a little wind on the embers, and we'll see what happens then. One of the policy questions, which we haven't really debated around about sanctions, but it's a broader question, is you always have a trade-off between very targeted sanctions, as we've tried against IRGC members, proliferators, and so forth, and broader base sanctions, which impact ordinary people a little bit more, but if you go too far, then you irreparably damage the economy and add a great deal more corruption like what occurred in, in Iraq. And so ultimately the question for policymakers is to have how to have that balance where you maximize cost, you have enough cost to facilitate grassroots movements uh, and ultimately create a situation where the Iranians will feel that even if they have oil revenue, what goes up comes down, that ultimately the isolation just isn't worth it anymore. I think you raise a really interesting point on um, reducing the value, and I, again, no easy answers here, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll highlight something Michael has said, um, which is the sort of ideological perspective of this regime. I don't know at this stage in the history of the Islamic Republic that it would be possible to provide uh, an alternative sense of security that, that replaces what they perceive as the security value that they achieve with some sort of nuclear program. And, and ultimately, I think the final resolution to our concerns about the Iranian nuclear program will only come when we see a change in the character of the leadership. It may still be called an Islamic Republic. It may still feature some of these same faces. I believe that there is uh, the capacity for hypocrisy and for moral conversions, just as there were among former communists. I think we will see uh, former Islamic Republic uh, officials who suddenly see the benefits of a different sort of a regime. Uh, but I do think that uh, we will not see a, a shift in, in the, the commitment to the nuclear program and, and the perception of the value of the nuclear program and until and unless we see some sort of change in this regime. Um, and again, ultimately, I just think we have a limited ability to affect that from outside. Uh, last question in the first row down front. Here. Um, Diane Perlman, School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution at George Mason. Um, first of all, I wasn't going to say this, but um, Johann Gautung in 1967 referred to what he called the naive theory of sanctions, which is we're going to apply the sanctions, then the population is going to um, you know, change their attitude, you know, make the change in the regime. 
So um, sometimes it, it may be more likely to provoke defiance, increase the popularity of hardliners, and have the opposite effect and, and increase the value of sanctions. So I'd like to also talk a little bit about the relationship and the idea of second order change, where first order change is you deal with the symptom, namely the, the program, versus the relationship. And just to remind us that after 9-11, that a million Iranians had candlelight vigils for us. They helped us with intelligence with al-Qaeda. Um, they had a, a proposal in 2003 that you know they were rejected and called the axis of evil. So it gets to be disheartening when it overtures and also the, um, the intervention from Turkey and Brazil during the NPT. So every time they do something, it, it kind of gets Dist. So, in terms of a, like a third way or um, dealing with mediation or perhaps bringing in Turkey or thinking of things in, like giving a face saving way out, doing some create, something creative or mediation might be more promising. It's actually an interesting point you bring up because while Iranians had a candlelight vigil, both the Supreme Leader and Kehan newspaper and the official organs were quite active in actually doing the opposite from what the Iranian people had promoted spontaneously. And this is ultimately the problem in the regime, that the regime tends to be a lot less moderate than the people. And this is fundamentally the reason for the distrust with regard to the nuclear program. The 2003 issue, there was a court action based on a libel suit in which the person who promoted this um, this theory of the 2003 grand bargains, emails were exposed in the discovery process. And what was determined was that he had sent an email to the Iranian ambassador to the United Nations saying, what was the origin of this? Was it Iranian? And the Iranian ambassador to the United Nations, Mohammad Javad Zarif, said, no, it didn't come from us. Um, and so there's a great deal of dispute, even among proponents of engagement, like Richard Armitage, about the legitimacy of that. Um, but ultimately, Yes. I mean, if there's going to be a solution, perhaps it will come when there is a new formula that's discovered. But what I would put forward is after 33 years, and almost 33 years of constant attempts at diplomacy, that both sides have, are very clear on what each other's positions are. That if there was a magic formula, it would have already been discovered. And I'm not sure whether... Um, hoping that there's some magical third way without empowering the Iranian people or making the Iranian government a little bit more accountable to their people um, is going to bear any success. And also, just lastly, with regard to the theory of sanctions, I would say that, I mean, I'm trained as a historian rather than a poli -sci um, political scientist, so I'm looking at it from the ground up. Whatever it is in other countries, I would argue that there's been no evidence that the Iranian people blame um, the West for the economic hardships which they've had, far more effective than sanctions has been Iran's own massive mismanagement of their own economy. Uh, and just with regard to social science in general, um, I mean, there's been a lack of history of predictive accuracy on all sides of the issue, um, but it certainly does raise good questions. And, and so for that, I, I thank you. Yeah, surprisingly, Michael and I have a, a little more agreement here. Um, I think, you know, we're here in Washington. It's very easy to, to you know, it's my job to find fault with uh, the current administration. Otherwise, uh, I'm just an echo chamber, whatever that administration might be. Uh, and so we criticize this, the, the administration's actions. And it's always Washington's fault when engagement doesn't succeed. And it's always Washington's fault when somehow, uh, you know, a, a kind of reformist moment in Iran, and it was a genuine, serious, and sustained one, transforms into something much, much, much uglier and more problematic. But ultimately, it's not always our fault. You know, really, we had limited ability uh, to affect the, the, the complexion of the Iranian uh, political sphere. And so, you know, whether the, the phrase axis of evil was used uh, did not manifestly alter the trajectory of Iranian politics. And uh, the overtures of 2003 were, were hypothetical, offerings by several officials in collaboration with the Swiss ambassador, and they never represented a serious, legitimate, uh, endorsed uh, 
offer from the Iranian regime on high. And I know this from people who were involved in the process on the Iranian side. So I think that you know we tend to focus on the failures because it's easy for us to criticize our own government. And over there, it's a little bit more opaque. But let's be clear, there's plenty of fault for both, so for, for, for both sides in the way that this has played out. Um, I would disagree in the sense that I think that there that that there is a you know this is a bit like the peace process. We all know what the shape of a solution might look like at this stage because we've had people on both sides talk a little bit about what that might look like. It's a kind of Japan model here, a, a model under which Iran would retain considerable civilian right to enrichment, as is their right under the NPT, under severe constraints and restrictions and inspections. Um, with uh, you know a lot of distrust and a lot of unhappiness, but at least some greater ability to verify what is the nature of the program, and greater ability to move around the country and see. It would not be perfect. It's not an ideal solution from our perspective, and it's why in 2003, when it might have been possible to achieve just that kind of a solution, the Bush administration wouldn't even consider it. Um, today, from the Iranian side, it's not clear that they would consider it, but I think that on both sides, there is a, a sort of outcome. It's just getting to that outcome. It's creating the sort of political environment in which the negotiations that can go, can go on and you can arrive at the solution that both sides probably, not surely, not happily, but probably could live with and that would be ultimately something that the international community would benefit from. Um, and I think, you know, when I say we could all live with it, I say it because I recognize that Iranian politics is always changing and that by the time we get to that solution, we're, we're probably going to be in a better place of Iranian politics. Um, but with that, let me just move on okay. because I know yeah, you I, all I want think, to get to the uh, next phase. Uh, right, right. I, I think we're now at the point where uh, uh, I want to give both of you an opportunity to wrap up and, and make final remarks. Uh, you, uh, Dr. Maloney, saying why you think sanctions are counterproductive and then uh, you, Mr. Rubin, saying again uh, why you think they, uh, they, they're they ultimately aiding the U.S.'s cause and, and U.S. policy towards Iran. One minute or less, I'll just repeat what I started with. I think there are a number of reasons why the sanctions are not leading us to a negotiated solution. The sanctions may lead us to a long-term containment and degradation of the regime, but that's ultimately what we say we don't want. Uh, sanctions are not going to produce uh, a greater Iranian willingness to come to the negotiating table. They're not going to produce moderation. Uh, Iran is more insulated, more capable of evading and mitigating the sanctions. And the political character of this current regime makes it impossible for them to concede on an issue of this significance to their own security. And so ultimately, I think we have uh, produced the very outcome that the Obama administration hoped to avoid, which is a situation in which diplomacy cannot succeed. I'd argue that the key issue we need to address is how to raise the cost of the sanction, uh, cost of Iran's nuclear program so high that the Iranians will ultimately choose to decide that the price simply isn't worth it. Perhaps that can't be done solely through sanctions. Um, one of the side benefits of this, however, is that the greater pain the Iranian government feels, the more incentive they have to negotiate to lift that pain. Um, I don't understand, if I will just concluding very briefly, how 1920, UN Security Council 1929 could be working and then suddenly by having more unilateral sanctions, suddenly it's not. Perhaps the issue was that the sanctions hadn't gone broad enough in the fr um, first place. Diplomacy without preconditions is very, very problematic. We can talk about all the gain to having sanctions, but when President Obama said we will negotiate without preconditions about uranium enrichment suspension and so forth. In effect, what he did was unilaterally cancel three very hard-fought UN Security Council resolutions. The last issue, which we haven't addressed as much, but ultimately is the determinant what will work or not, is the role of ideology. Because multiculturalism isn't just being about going into a sushi restaurant and ordering a mojito. Fundamentally, it's about different people thinking in very different ways, and we need to recognize that the Iranians, when they approach this issue, are approaching it with a very different calculus and very different style than perhaps the Americans are. I would like all of you to join me in thanking our debaters. I think we've had a very informative and nuanced discussion. Okay, and the bar remains open for a little while, and you guys can uh, clean up whatever food's left over. Thank you all for coming.